Hello my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, my name is Richard Aline, one of the brothers from Handsworth Ecclesia in Birmingham in England. So what a wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to share some thoughts with you from the other side of the planet. Um, probably whilst I'm asleep somehow. Uh, you're, you're probably watching this whilst I'm in bed. But um, look, I, I come to you this morning with a call to persevere. That's my aim, is to encourage you to continue in your faith. I'm studying through the book of Hebrews at the moment with uh, a small group of people, and it's written to a diverse group, it seems, um, people with all on all different stages of their journeys of faith. Some presumably were very clear and strong in their faith. Others were finding it difficult for various reasons. Um, it seems that some were going through all sorts of suffering and difficulties and therefore what they would do is, um, you know, potentially have doubts or questions or find themselves in places where their faith was not very strong. And the writer to the Hebrews recognises this and he seems to be encouraging this group of people, these brothers and sisters, to keep on going. Now we're going to focus in on Hebrews chapter 12 shortly, but just look at this from Hebrews chapter 10 as the context. Remember those earlier days, verse 32, after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. I mean, even those words right there, that the challenge some of these brothers and sisters were going through, it, that they had to endure in a great conflict full of suffering. God, it must have been so difficult. Verse 33, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. How did you do this? How did you suffer alongside those in prison? How did you joyfully accept the confiscation of your pro property? How did you face going through all of these difficulties and challenges? Well, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded be speaking straight to us, couldn't he? Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And it goes on. You need to persevere. You need to. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. You know, it's difficult, isn't it, sometimes to to think about, well, where is this kingdom? I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting. Is it ever going to come? We start to ask these questions. No, no. In just a little while. That's the perspective that he gives us. It might feel like it's years and years and decades to us, but, but in God's perspective, actually in the perspective of eternal life, it's just in a little while. He who is coming will come and will not delay. So you need to persevere. Verse 38, and, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Really powerful words there in Hebrews 10. And then, of course, we have Hebrews 11, don't we, which is filled with that amazing chapter that's filled with um, uh, men and women of faith, people who held on to promises, even, if, even though they didn't see them, they were assured of them. They saw them afar off. And then we come to Hebrews 12. So Hebrews 12, verse 1. And here's the encouragement for us then. Therefore, <clears throat> since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. That's how 
Hebrews 12 verse 1 starts the first half of the verse. We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I don't know if any of you saw the Olympics this summer. And I have to say, I uh, didn't watch any of it, to be honest. Um, Olympics 2012 in London. Gosh, I watched uh, probably 50% of that or may, maybe more. It was exciting when it was in, in England. Um, but this year, I think I was still sort of hungover from losing England, using, losing the Euros in that... Um, in the final um, so I just I didn't watch any any of the Olympics but the, what the writer is wanting us to do is to imagine that kind of scenario imagine that kind of crowd that's um, you know that crowd that would cheer on Mo Farah or that crowd that would cheer on um, uh, what's his name Bol uh, Usain Bolt um, that that stadium that's packed full of people saying keep on going keep on go shouting their name that the, the kind of veins popping out of their heads because they're so they so are willing on that athlete that runner to finish this race and to win this race and and that's the image that that he's trying to give to us in hebrews 12 and he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And he's referring to Hebrews 11, isn't he? He's saying, look at all these people. Because the, the interesting thing is the people in this crowd, the people in the crowd that are cheering us on. And by the way, nobody's ever really cheered me on in any races. because I've not been all that uh, fast in my life. But the people that are cheering us on are all those men and women of faith who have done the race themselves, who have run the marathon. Who have got to that point where it's really difficult at the end of that race when your legs are burning, when you're out of breath, when you're sweating, when you're absolutely exhausted, when you everything in your body's like, I just want to stop. I just want to keep on going. But then there's this crowd of people saying, keep on going. But they're not just spectators. They're people who have run the race themselves. And they know um, what it feels like. They've experienced it. And they've crossed the finish line and now they're on the other side they're waiting they've they're awaiting this uh um crowning ceremony the, the, the medal giving ceremony that they're waiting and they're saying come on i did it you can do it too and that's who all of those men and women of faith are in hebrews chapter 11. but i think it's more than that it's it's more than just those people in hebrews 11 and throughout the scriptures there are probably people in your lives who have gone before you, who you know are cheering you on. I lost my mum, uh, my dad in 2017 and my mum in November <clears throat> last year to cancer. And she, they were both incredibly faithful people. And watching my parents, particularly my mum, who, who died a difficult death, I would say, seeing her faith unwavered, holding on, getting stronger as her body got weaker, and seeing her faith and the discussions that we would have about faith and what it meant and, and, um, and how important it was and focusing on the kingdom and all these, you know, crucial beautiful discussions that that we had in her final months of life not just in her final months but you know all the way through through her life and eventually she fell asleep and gosh we it was a very very difficult time but I take so much comfort in the fact that she has finished this race you know those words where it says there's a crown of righteousness awaiting um, those who love his appearing that that's my mum and my dad and and so i know even though they they're asleep now i know that that they in a sense in that sense are cheering me on come on son come on richard keep on going you can do this and i look at them gosh mom you did that gosh dad you you finished your races right i'm gonna keep on going even though my i've got the lactic acid building up in my muscles and it and it's you know it's a real struggle but you did it i'm going to keep on going 
And I just want you to reflect then just for a moment, who is it that's cheering you on? Who in the Bible? Who are those characters? Or, or who in your own life who has gone before you is cheering you on? The verse goes on to say, right, let us um, throw off any, everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. Now, some of you are probably old enough, like I am, to remember Bob Lloyd. Um, and I'll never forget a, a, a talk that he did on, on Hebrews 12. And, and what he did, it was a, a beautiful example. He, he got this um, young, fit guy uh, outside. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if I was there with you, I'd probably reenact this, but I'm not. But So Bob Lloyd got this young, fit guy outside and he said, do you think you can beat me? Bob Lloyd is an old man at this point. And the, the guy was like, yeah, yeah, I can beat you. And Bob Lloyd was like, fine, okay. But there's only one rule though. You've got to carry these deck chairs. And he put on this guy a whole load of um, collapsible, you know, those old deck chairs that, that would become all tangled up and <clears throat> you can never set them up straight. Got them to, got this kid to carry a whole stack of these. And then they'd have this race. And of course, Bob Lloyd would win because this guy was weighed down by these deck chairs and of course in this picture it's a picture of sin it's the things that hinder us and 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 like it says there so e easily entangles us it's almost like you've got this rope around you you're trying to carry these deck chairs and you've got this rope around your feet you're trying to run a race and what he's saying is get get rid of anything that that gets in the way of following jesus so i've put it up here as lesson two get get rid of anything that that gets in the way of following jesus and so the question becomes for you, what is entangling you? What's getting in the way of you following Jesus? And, and just go, to go back to the verse, um, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders. So it's not just put it down, it's chuck it away from you as far as you can. That's, that's the idea of this verse. Get, look at what's hindering you. Now, I don't know what it is for you, whether it's your covetousness your addiction, your guilt, your um, the wounds that you carry, the voices that have spoken into your life telling you you're not good enough. I, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's money, maybe it's your the amount of TV you watch. I, I, I don't know. But whatever it is, if it's hindering you on this race and it's distracting you from Jesus, and throw it off Entang untangle yourself and start running it goes on to say um, verse 2 fixing our eyes on Jesus the beginner the ender the perfecter the completer of our faith for the joy set before him we know these these verses very well for the joy set before him Jesus uh, persevered the cross scorning its shame and is now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God consider Jesus who persevered such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart now some of you will know that um, our Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson who's pictured here was in hospital with COVID at, at some point now I, I love this picture because if you look at Boris he's um he's red face I mean he just looks like he's in agony right I'm not saying <laughs> I like him being in that, but but he's um he's finding this run difficult. And you look at the the personal trainer next to him; he's just like out for a little jog, isn't he? Because he's fit and healthy. And I don't know if any of you have ever had a personal trainer. I had one. I, I used to carry a, a bit more weight than I do now. And um, Michaela, my wife, got me a personal trainer for my birthday one year. And I had this guy Darren for something like I think it was 12 or 16 weeks and I tell you right now I hated this guy uh, to be honest he he was uh, I used to dread him turning up and and it was because what he would get me to do was like right come on we're going outside now we're going to run up and down this hill 20 times we're going to run for two and a half miles we're going to come back and do these weights and I couldn't do it and I was breathless and I was in pain and it was almost like with every spare breath that I could muster, I would curse him under my breath. You know, it was that kind of situation. But it was partly because he was so fit and I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to be like this. 
And of course, what he would do was run alongside me. Come on, Richard. And I'd be like, I've got to stop. I can't do it anymore. Come on, Richard, you can do it. Not in that gentle voice, actually. He was like, no, no, you can't stop. Keep on going. Keep on going. You know, push me and push me. And of course, eventually I started to see the change. And I did start to lose weight. And my resentment for him <laughs> turned more into appreciation. Now, I'm just using that example because, you know, the point that this is making is when you've got a trainer, Jesus, who's alongside you saying, keep on going, don't stop. So we've got this great crowd of witnesses all around us shouting and cheering you on. But then you've got Jesus as well, your trainer. Come on, keep on going. Don't give up. And, and, and that's what he is. And so it says, fix your eyes on him. Listen to his voice. Fix your eyes on him. Let him encourage you. Let him help you as you keep on going on this race. And so it's this idea of, yeah, look at the finish line. Look at this crown of glory that's, that's awaiting you. Look at Jesus on this at the right hand of God, on, on, on the throne of God. He's with you. He's with you. Um, I, I didn't say at the beginning, but I've got, these are seven lessons that I've picked out from Hebrews 12, and we're on lesson four. Um, and this is perhaps the most difficult one. And I say that because I find this one most difficult to understand. If you read um, down from verse 4 down to verse 11 and you read about discipline from God, I, I think these are some very difficult verses. Let, let me read a couple of them. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his sons? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Now obviously you can read this these verses for yourselves and it's and I, and I don't always understand it because you kind of think well what does that mean? Does that mean that my mum's cancer was you know given to her by God or I mean I I, I don't so that she could learn. I mean do, do bad things happen because God's putting us through things so that we could learn or 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 is it just that there are bad things that happen because we live in a fallen world and, you know, I, I don't know the answer to these things. I don't know the answer. But what I do know from my personal experience is that verse 11 is so true. That no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. For those who have been trained by it. You know, going back to my mum's cancer journey, she, um, it was painful. You know, one of the verses that always stood out to us was this idea that um, uh, the, the outer, outer man is perishing day by day, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. And me and mum really focused in on that, that look, her body, we could see it deteriorating, we could see it changing, but, and yet she was finding new strength, new levels of faith, new depth of relationship with God that she'd probably never experienced in her 71 years prior. And it took this whole extremely difficult process, which lasted for about three years, for her to come to levels of, of deepness, and closeness with God that she'd never known before. And I think for me as well, you know, I've not gone through that suffering directly, but um, seeing, losing someone, having grief, having those kinds of challenging emotions, you know, I've, I've, I've learned to depend on God. I trust because I believe in the resurrection, because it, it, it all feels, because it's also true. And look, I don't know the reasons for difficulties and sufferings, but I know it can feel awful. But I know that there's strength and peace and righteousness to be found through it. Maybe it is that God doesn't 
ever say I'll take you out of this but I'll be with you as you walk through the valley I've put lesson five as this never ever give up and that's because um, when you read from verse 12 downwards I mean look at some of this language therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness no one will see the Lord see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many I mean sometimes relationships are difficult but it's saying in this example, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. But it's more than this because, um, but, and I just want to highlight that language. It's it's make every effort. And, and I went through uh, the whole chapter. I've just picked out, look, look at these words. Let's run with perseverance. Consider him who endured. There's a struggle that you have with sin. Endure hardship. Make every effort to live in peace. And that's just from Hebrews 12. You look through the whole book of Hebrews and you get these same types of words. Keep on going, persevere, endure, don't give up. And, and here it is, and I just wanted to put this down in lesson five, just stark, just clear. Don't give up. It's worth it. And then it says, don't be like Esau. Verse 16, who for a single meal sold his inheritance now i don't know what esau's meal was like but it must have been pretty amazing perhaps perhaps it wasn't perhaps it was like this soggy old big mac but he was so hungry at the time that he just would eat whatever it was and how did he treat his birthright his inheritance it's that it's like if i if i if I offered you, if you were hung, really hungry one day and I said, look, you've got a billion, I'll sell you this Big Mac for a billion pounds, a billion dollars or, you know, you, it would just, you'd be like, of course I'm not going to do that. But that's kind of what, that's the, the how ridiculous it is that e Esau gave up his inheritance for a single meal. And that's what the, the writer to the Hebrews is saying to us. He's, he's. You know, and look at this verse from Corinthians. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind, I think I've missed it out, but no mind has even considered what God has prepared for those who love him. My goodness. And give it up from me. Uh, and so I think what stands out to me is that, look, I'm, I'm in my 40s now and, and I, uh, you know, I've, se I've seen what this world has to offer. I've, I've seen jumps in technology. I've, I've seen the iPhone come out. I've seen Tesla produce their electric car. I've seen, you know, thin screen TVs and um, stuff that the world has to offer. And actually, it's not all that great. It doesn't fix my creaking knees. It doesn't stop my aching joints. It doesn't stop my, my hair turning grey. These are things which distract us. They're temporary. And and what the writer is saying is, there's, no, there's nothing else in this world that's worth it. That's worth giving up your inheritance for. So whatever your sin is, you know, like we said right at the beginning, whatever your sin is, whatever your struggle is, whatever's entangling you, it's not worth it. Your inheritance is worth holding on to. And so look, we're going to come to lesson seven, where at the end of the chapter then, he reminds us about what this is that, that's so worth holding on to. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to, and I love this image, thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly the, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven written in the book of life thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly and verse 28 therefore since we are we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, unshakable, no earthquake, 
no strength of man, no disaster, no virus is going to shake this kingdom. None of that is going to shake this kingdom. This is the kingdom we are receiving. It's not going to become outdated. Nothing better is going to replace it. So let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Brothers and sisters, we're all on this journey. We're all on this marathon race and it gets hard. It really does. There are all sorts of obstacles. We're all on a slightly different race, aren't we? We've all got our own journey, our own path, our own obstacles, our own challenges, our own difficulties, our own temptations, our own sins, our own problems that we face. But the writer to the Hebrews is saying, don't give up. Don't give up. Look at Jesus. Think about that crowd of witnesses who are cheering you on. Look at Jesus who's gone before you, who's speaking to you, who's saying, come on, my my brother. Come on, my sister. Keep on going. There's an unshakable kingdom coming. Now we're going to share bread and wine now. Um, And yes, I I pray that you will do this and be encouraged, encouraged to keep on going. That I've called you today and myself to persevere. God bless.